Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment. Developing right now on Morning News Now, rebellion. A short-lived revolt in Russia could result in potentially long-term impacts worldwide. This morning, mercenary rebels are no longer on the march to Moscow, and their leader is now in exile for what's being called the biggest threat to Vladimir Putin's 23-year reign in Russia. Now, what we've seen is um, Russia having to defend Moscow, its capital, against mercenaries of its own making. Uh, so in and of itself, that's extraordinary. Now, Ukraine's president is calling the rebellion a sign of Putin's weakness. We have team coverage. More on the crisis, the fallout, and what it means for the war in Ukraine. Also this morning, summer swelter developing right now. Millions in Texas are bracing for more record-setting heat, with temperatures expected to soar past 100 degrees today. And in other parts of the country, severe weather alerts are in effect from the southwest to the northeast. We're tracking it all. Underwater threat, an international investigation is now underway, looking into what led up to that deadly implosion of the Titanic tourist submersible. The latest on that, plus the renewed concerns about the dangers of so-called adventure tourism. And turning champagne problems into champagne solutions. Taylor Swift's ultra-popular Eras Tour is not just packing stadiums, it's also generating billions of dollars for local economies. So put the money in a bag and find out how Swifties could be behind a big, much-needed boost for the tourism industry. Good to have you with us on this Monday after a busy news weekend. We are going to begin this morning with new questions about the future of Russian President Vladimir Putin following that shocking but short-lived rebellion. In a dizzying turn of events, an armed rebellion threatened to topple Putin from power. And just as suddenly as it started, it appeared to quickly come to a peaceful end. It began on Friday when Yevgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner Group, accused Russia's defense minister of ordering an attack on his soldiers. Now, the Wagner Group had been fighting alongside Russian troops. The mercenary leader also accused Russian leadership of launching the war in Ukraine based on lies. His troops abandoned their positions in Ukraine, then marched into Russia. In a televised address, President Putin called Prigozhin's rebellion a stab in the back and treason and betrayal. Then early Saturday, Prigozhin marched his troops into the south Russian city of Rostov-on-Don. Tanks and mercenary troops took over the streets there and eventually took control of a key military headquarters. From there, a column of mercenaries began marching on Moscow. They eventually moved within 120 miles of the Russian capital. Then late Saturday, an abrupt turnaround with both sides agreeing to a deal that was brokered by the leader of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko. Under the terms of the deal, the Kremlin said Prigozhin would not face any charges but would live in exile in Belarus. A lot to cover, and we have full team coverage this morning, including what it means for Putin's future and the future of the war in Ukraine. Let's begin in Ukraine, in the capital, Kyiv. That's where we find NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea. So, Kelly, this has been, as we said, the biggest challenge to Vladimir Putin's power in more than 20 years. In the wake of this deal, what's the message out of the Kremlin this morning and from Russian military leaders? Are we hearing from them? Well, I think the message specifically from the Russian uh, defense ministry is stability. Uh, today, they released video of the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, visiting troops. Now, we don't know when this video sh was shot. We don't know where it was shot. But the point is, they released the video showing him doing his job. And it's important because one of the key points raised by Prigozhin, that mercenary leader, was that he wanted Shoigu removed. He wanted him and the, the military chief of his staff both removed from their positions that clearly hasn't happened the other points that are very interesting today are that we have not yet seen or heard from uh, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, since that five-minute address to the nation as this rebellion was taking place over the weekend. We also don't know the whereabouts of the man who led this rebellion, Yevgeny uh, Prigozhin. He was, the Kremlin said, was going to be allowed to go to Belarus. All of his Telegram-affiliated channels have gone silent, his social media channels 
channels where he has been very, very active and very effective at spreading his message. But we now do not know his whereabouts. He, he was last seen on video apparently uh, leaving that city, Rostov on Don, in the south of Russia, the city that his forces had taken control of. Joe. You know, and Kelly, what's interesting is over the weekend video from that captured Russian city of Rostov on Don, it actually showed Russians cheering Prigozhin and the Wagner group. Do we know what has been the reaction on the ground in Russia? Well, I guess it sort of depends where you are, first of all. Yes, those those crowds were cheering Wagner fighters. And that, remember, is a town that is very, very close to the fight in Ukraine. It's, it's within, I think, 100 kilometers, about 60, 70 miles of the border. Uh, so there, in particular, you would find people who are very pro-military, uh, potentially pro-Wagner fighter as well. But it's interesting, in, in, in hearing from some of the people living in Moscow, some people described it as... Uh, shocking, worrying, incomprehensible, confusing. One man said, look, we support Wagner fighters. We support our president. Now we don't know how to reconcile that. So a confusing time, I think, for people in Russia. And, and it's also confusing what's going to happen in, in Ukraine with the war there. What's the reaction where you are in Ukraine to all this internal drama in Russia? Yeah, so as you mentioned, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, the president here, has been talking about this a lot, trying to take advantage of the message anyway, uh, on, on messaging, saying that this shows that uh, Russia is weak, that bosses in Russia are weak, that there is chaos uh, in Russia, uh, and that the only country that can protect Europe and protect the world right now is Ukraine. So keep supporting Ukraine. On the actual battlefield, what is the impact? We don't really know yet. We don't know how much of an impact Wagner forces were, were having when all of this took place. And we don't know how many of those fighters uh, are going to join the regular Russian military. So a lot still to be seen in the days, weeks to come, Joe. All right. Kelly Kobiea in Kiev. Kelly, thank you so much. The State Department is keeping a close eye on the situation in Russia this morning following a weekend of startling events. Our coverage continues with NBC's Chuck Todd. Well, hello there, Joe. This week on Meet the Press, Secretary of State Antony Blinken joined me to discuss the chaos that unfolded over the weekend in Russia between that mercenary force, the Wagner Group, and President Putin. Take a look at what he had to say about the rebellion. What we've seen is extraordinary. Think about it this way. Sixteen months ago, Russian forces were on the doorstep of Kiev in Ukraine, uh, believing they would take the capital in a matter of days and erase the country from, from the map as an independent country. Now, what we've seen is um, Russia having to defend Moscow, its capital, against mercenaries of its own making. Uh, so in and of itself, that's extraordinary. And in so doing, um, we've also seen rise to the surface profound questions about the very premises for this Russian aggression against Ukraine that Prigozhin surfaced very publicly, as well as a direct challenge to, to Putin's authority. What you ended up seeing versus what the intelligence said, how accurate was it? Well, Chuck, I'm obviously not going to comment on intelligence matters. What I can say is this. I think it's been no secret to many people over many months that these tensions were rising. They were brewing. Uh, Prigozhin was already saying some rather extraordinary things about Russia's conduct of the war in Ukraine and going directly at R Russia's military leadership. So this was a, a, a rising storm, uh, but I'm not going to comment on, on the intelligence itself. The dismantling of the Wagner Group. First of all, do you believe it's being dismantled? And if so, what does this mean in Africa and Syria? Too, too soon to tell. Uh, we'll, we'll see if uh, this means that Wagner forces are, are coming out of Ukraine. I mean, the very fact that over the weekend, <laughs> Wagner forces were coming out of Ukraine and going into Russia and toward Moscow okay. uh, in and of itself is, uh, is extraordinary. You can see my full interview with him at meetthepress.com. You can also get more Meet the Press right here on NBC News Now every single weekday at 4 p.m. All right, Chuck, thank you so much. Let's get more now from Washington with NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba. So, Monica, Secretary Blinken really has been the main voice on this from the White House. Anything else he said we didn't hear there in that interview with Chuck? And is it significant that we haven't yet heard anything from President Biden? 
Well, I think the strategy is really by design, Joe. The administration was watching this so closely. There were so many fast-moving developments. They didn't want to get ahead of anything, and they didn't want to also give any kind of perception that the West was at all involved in what they are referring to as this Russian internal affair. So they're really letting the diplomacy do the talking, and that's why the main chief diplomat for the United States, the Secretary of State, was the one out talking about what he is seeing, but also with this conclusion that they're stressing that it's just too soon to draw any conclusions about what this could mean. Take a listen. I think we've seen more cracks emerge in the, the Russian facade. It is too soon to tell exactly where they go uh, and, and when they get there. But certainly uh, we, we have all sorts of new questions that Putin is going to have to address in the weeks and months ahead. Secretary Blinken was working the phones all weekend, talking to critical counterparts. So was Secretary of Defense Austin. And then, of course, President Biden himself. On Saturday, he spoke with the leaders of Germany, France, and the UK to reaffirm support for Ukraine. And then yesterday, he had a call with Ukrainian President Zelensky, which we were expecting where the two did discuss the events in Russia. That's the way the White House put it. Again, not wanting to put any labels on this until they can get a little bit more information, assess a little bit more. And today is likely the first time we may hear the president speak about this, because over the weekend, when prompted by reporters a couple of times coming and going from Camp David, he declined to answer questions, Joe. So lots of questions about the future. But Monica, looking back a little bit, we understand U.S. intelligence did actually know about a potential plot to challenge Moscow's military leaders. I mean, what has NBC News learned about that? Yeah, and you saw there Secretary Blinken alluding to this rising storm. So obviously they were following it, they say, for weeks and months, this tension between Yevgeny Prigozhin and the Russian military specifically. And we had seen that, but in the last 10 days or so, I'm told by U.S. officials, there was an escalatory rise, a significant one that did sort of show that perhaps Prigozhin was planning to mount this challenge. And another sign that U.S. intelligence picked up on that was the fact that he was amassing weapons and forces. So I'm told that senior officials throughout the administration were briefed about some of that intelligence last Wednesday, and then alarm bells really started to go off internally on Friday. And that's why National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, who was supposed to travel to Copenhagen for some talks about Ukraine, scrapped the trip, decided to stay back and monitor the situation so he could keep the president informed. He briefed him all weekend at Camp David. And there were a couple of other signs we saw like that as well. But again, the U.S. very careful not to want to comment on this as it's still a quite volatile situation. All right, Monica Alba covering the Biden administration. Monica, thank you so much. Let's dig a little deeper into this with NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs. Colonel, always good to have you with us on a story like this. So first of all, I mean, just help us understand how unprecedented the events of this past weekend were. Have we seen anything like this in Russia in recent times? No, not during uh, Putin's reign. He's been in business for 23 years and has had an iron grip on the entire apparatus of the state and the military. Uh, but it's not unprecedented in Russia. Russia's history is replete with mutinies of all types and varieties going back all the way back to the 16th century. Uh, you see this all the time, however, in autocratic states because it's the only way that you can have regime change if you get the military behind you. So there's almost always military action and mutinies in situations in which there's going to be or there's an attempt to have regime change. But what this has done, obviously, is to demonstrate that Putin is not necessarily in total control of the apparatus and demonstrates the inability of the uh, Russian military to control all of the people under its command, Joe. Colonel, let's talk about this Wagner group. We've heard a lot about them in the last year. Richard Engel recently did some incredible reporting about their impact and influence in Africa. Help us understand, how powerful is the Wagner group, and are they actually capable of taking on Moscow? Well, the only way they're going to be able to take on Moscow physically is if they get the rest of the Russian army behind them as they march towards Moscow. That's probably not going to happen, and pro certainly not anytime soon. But Wagner, Wagner Group is very, very important to the Russian, uh, the persecution of the Russian uh, uh, mission inside Ukraine. They are probably the only uh, 
organization in the Russian military that is not totally inept. Um, the Russian army has demonstrated that it, it tactically, uh, neither tactically nor strategically, can accomplish the mission it had assigned itself. Uh, and Wagner itself has been successful only in small places. It was hugely successful in Bakhmut initially, but otherwise has not demonstrated any capability to be any further threat to Russia, Joe. Colonel, real quickly, how much is everything that we just saw happen in Russia going to impact the war in Ukraine now? Uh, the Russians need Wagner's troop with troops, which is why they've been trying desperately to sign the uh, Wagner's troops into the Russian military. Uh, at the end of the day, what is going to happen inside Ukraine is wholly dependent upon Western support for Ukraine on the one hand and the ability of the Russian military to continue the war. And at the moment, the two people at the top of the military ladder in Russia, uh, Gerasimov and Shoigu, have demonstrated that they are not capable of continuing the war successfully. Uh, these are very interesting and difficult times for both sides, Joe. All right. Colonel Jacobs, always appreciate your expertise, especially on a story like this. Thank you so much. Other news now. In Pennsylvania, the trial for the Tree of Life synagogue shooter is entering the penalty phase this morning. The jury will now decide whether 50-year-old Robert Bowers gets life in prison without the possibility of parole or the death penalty. Earlier this month, that same jury found Bowers guilty of 63 criminal counts, including multiple hate crimes. Crimes. 11 people were killed in the 2018 shooting, which was the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in American history. It's expected this stage of the trial could take at least six weeks. Temperatures are once again soaring in the south today, hitting triple digits for yet another day. This as several states in the Midwest clean up after multiple tornadoes and severe storms tore through the country's midsection. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson joined us now from Houston with more on this. Priscilla, good morning. Joe, good morning. In just a few hours, this splash pad is going to be filled with kids looking to get some relief from those 100 degree temperatures that we're expected to see here in Houston today. It marks the third week in a row of a historic heat wave that is battering millions across the South. This morning, terrifying tornadoes and sweltering summer heat combining for a brutal one two punch of wild weather. I don't think we're done climbing on temperature. Temperatures across the South again topping triple digits, baking some hard hit communities for the third straight week. Tens of millions facing even more heat alerts in the coming days. This year it feels hotter than regular. In sweltering Southwest Texas, the National Park Service says a 14 year old boy got sick, lost consciousness and died while hiking in Big Bend National Park, where temperatures hit nearly 120 degrees. The boy's stepfather rushed to find help and was found dead, officials say, after his car crashed over an embankment. Both deaths remain under investigation. As Southerners hope for relief from the heat, the Midwest is reeling from another round of dangerous twisters. I think it's gonna miss us. Communities in Minnesota and Indiana hit by multiple tornadoes. Residents forced to take cover. Slammed the door at the last minute, locked it, ran in and jumped over my little boy in the bathtub. And in Florida. Oh, no! New video shows the terrifying moments a fast-moving storm swept aboard a Royal Caribbean cruise ship leaving Port Canaveral. <laughs> Luckily, the cruise line says there were no serious injuries and the ship set sail as scheduled. As this summer of severe weather shows no signs of slowing down. And Joe, right now there are around 450,000 people throughout the country without power. We aren't seeing any major outages here in Texas, but the power grid operator here has issued a weather watch saying that they are expecting record high demand this week, but they say they do expect they'll be able to meet that demand. But I will tell you right now already, it is about 82 degrees out here, so it is very hot already and only getting hotter. I might need to take another pass through the water here in a second. Joe? Say, Priscilla, that fountain's gonna 
come in handy for you today, and we forgive you if you're a little drenched during your live shots yeah. throughout the day. Priscilla Thompson in Houston, thank you so <laughs> much. That. So let's get a check on what's next for the South, the Midwest, the rest of the country, and your morning news now weather forecast. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman's here. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, Joe. Great to see you. And we're going to see more of those dangerous temperatures. We're into the third week of seeing triple digits. It's going to go on and on. So no relief in sight. That's one of the big weather stories. The second one, severe weather. We're watching the risk once again today. It looks like it's going to target the East Coast. So this is what radar looks like right now. We have a couple severe storms moving through portions of the southeast, but it's really the east coast, the southeast through the mid-Atlantic, the northeast, even parts of New England that will see some showers and some thunderstorms today. So why is this happening? This is the big picture. We have an area of low pressure that's spinning over the Great Lakes. We have a trailing cold front that's coming off that area of low pressure. It's going to move off to the east, and that's going to spark the chance for some really strong storms. We could see winds gusting over 65 miles per hour. Could see some large hail, the chance of a few tornadoes, and really heavy downpours. We saw a couple of those over the weekend. Then as we look towards the south, south, we have an area of high pressure. Think of it like a heat pump. It's just pumping in that really warm air, that dangerous heat, and also some moisture. So that's what we're looking at in the south. Once you factor in that humidity, that's where we start to feel like 110, 120. So we have that severe threat. We have the dangerous heat once again. Now with the severe threat, we're looking at enhanced risk. That's pretty high on the scale. So that is where it's most likely where we're going to get those strong storms from Philadelphia to D.C., Richmond, also Raleigh. 58 million Americans under the gun for some severe weather. We're looking at the chance for those really gusty winds and also hail. Where you see this blue hatching area, that's where we're going to see the chance for some really gusty winds and heavy downpours. This could lead to flash flooding because we could locally see four inches. Where you see those brighter colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows, that's where we're looking at the chance for some really heavy rainfall. We could see some flooded roads, the creeks, the streams could rise as well. And we're going to see those summer-like downpours with two inches per hour or more. So here's a future cast as we go throughout time. We mentioned today, then tomorrow, that cold front's going to move way too slow off to the east so we're going to keep the shower threat in chance could see some storms as well and also the risk for some really heavy downpours that's tuesday wednesday notice that area of low pressure kind of lingering over the northeast so now scattered storms targeting parts of uh, new england uh, but we'll mention the heat alerts too because we're looking at 33 million people impacted by these heat alerts from the southwest all the way to portions of the tennessee valley and we're talking triple digits joe you've been working in the past, you know this the past three weeks where we just talk about it every single day it's just, we are stuck stop. in it. Yeah. doesn't stop. And that's where it gets super dangerous on the body. Yeah, and people just have to do their best to stay inside, yep. get that air conditioning, drink yes. plenty of fluids. And hope you have that. Exactly. We have not turned on our air conditioner yet, but this morning I was finally tempted because it's so it's humid, humid uh -huh. here. And oh, my goodness. you can feel it. You can just, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe you have not turned it on yet. I know. We've, so we've done so good so Pretty far. Good. But it's about to change. <laughs> All right, Michelle, thanks so much. Sure. We are back with new poll numbers as the summer presidential campaign heats up. A new NBC News poll shows that former President Trump is actually expanding his lead over that large field of other Republican candidates, this despite being indicted by a federal grand jury. NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray joins us now with more on all this. Mark, good to have you with us breaking down these numbers. So we should note this poll was conducted just a week after former President Trump was indicted by a grand jury. Those criminal charges, federal charges, are related to his handling of classified documents. So looking at the poll, how do you sum up the legal, the impact his legal troubles are having on his standing right now. Yeah, Joe, in the Republican race for president, it has only helped Donald Trump. Our poll shows that Donald Trump has a 29-point lead over Ron DeSantis and the rest of the Republican field. Former Vice President Mike Pence is at 7 percent. You end up having former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie at 5 percent and former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley at 4 percent. Back in April, Joe, after that first Donald Trump indictment on those New York charges, uh, we ended up having Donald Trump with a 15-point lead over Ron DeSantis and the rest of the field. So essentially, Donald Trump went from a 15-point lead in April to a 29-point lead right now. Mark, I want to take a look at another question from the polling. When asked if Trump should be the leader of the GOP, we have 49 percent saying yes, 21 percent saying he was a good leader, but it was time for a fresh take. 29 percent said the GOP needs a new leader overall. So what does this tell us right now about the future of the Republican Party? Joe, it tells us the Republican Party is divided right now. It's almost an even split. 49% want, want Donald Trump as the leader. 50% uh, say that they are at least are considering someone else or definitely want somebody else. Uh, but it is also worth noting in a multi-candidate field right now, 
49% is a pretty, pretty solid number. This race is yet to go head to head right now. Um, and when it's Donald Trump, where you have 49% of Republican primary voters saying that they want him to be the party's leader, that is something that he can take into the contest in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada. And probably, and, and that those could end up being winning percentages for him. I think the caveat here is, Joe, that we have a long time to go. And this is a national poll. It is not a poll of Iowa. It's not a poll of New Hampshire. So it's important to keep those things in mind. Real quickly, we should talk about the potential for a rematch in the 20, uh, from the 2020 election between Trump and Biden. What does the polling tell us if those two do go head to head? A close race, Joe. We have President uh, Joe Biden at 49 percent among registered voters, Donald Trump at 45 percent. That's a four point lead for Joe Biden within the polls margin of error. Um, it is also important to note that that four point lead is almost identical to uh, Joe Biden's uh, more than four point victory over Donald Trump in 2020. So in a lot of ways that, that this country has not moved or at least the general electorate has not moved all much from 2020. All right, Mark Murray breaking it down for us. Mark, thank you so much. International news now. Curfews are in effect across Honduras after a series of violent attacks. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us now with that and other world headlines. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Yes, about 20 people have died throughout the weekend in separate attacks all across Honduras. Well, 13 of them died after they were shot at a birthday party. Now, the country's president, Castro, descri described that particular incident as brutal and ruthless. The curfew is now in effect for Choloma and San Pedro Sula, the country's second largest city. It will run for 15 days. This comes on the heels of an ongoing partial state of emergency that has been in effect since December. This is all in an effort to combat violent gangs and drug crime across the Central American country. Now let's, over, let's travel over to Greece, where conservative leader Kriakos Mitsotakis secured the second term as prime minister in a landslide victory. In a statement, Mitsotakis said voters gave us a strong mandate to move faster on the course of big changes our country needs. Greece has remained in headlines amid an ongoing migrant crisis. Hundreds are dead and missing after the boat capsized near the country's coast. Now we end this tour of the world in the UK, where the Duchess of York is recovering after a successful surgery for breast cancer. A spokesperson for Sarah Ferguson says she, has, she was advised to undergo the procedure after a routine mammogram caught an early form of breast cancer. The rep added that the prognosis is good and that her diagnosis highlights the importance of regular screening. Ferguson has been an ongoing advocate for cancer research. Back to you, Joe. I had the privilege of meeting her more than 20 years ago. She was lovely to interview. We wish her all the best. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. The U.S. Coast Guard is launching an investigation into the Titan submersible implosion. The ship that launched the sub on its fatal journey did return to port over the weekend. Now an international investigation has started looking into what caused the implosion. All five men on board were killed. Investigators will also make recommendations about whether any civil or criminal sanctions should be pursued. But at a news conference on Sunday, officials added the investigation does not necessarily mean anything criminal has occurred. The full investigation could take up to two years. Now, the tragedy involving the Titan submersible is raising new questions about the risks of extreme tourist expeditions like this one. NBC News correspondent Jake Ward takes a closer look. This horrific disaster at a deep sea relic of the past is part of a dangerous new world of adventure for profit. Whether it was John Glenn rocketing into orbit or Jacques Cousteau exploring the wonders of the deep sea, risky adventures used to be just for the professionals. But now, if you have enough cash, private companies will take you on the adventure of a lifetime, even if they bend safety rules from time to time. Ocean Gate CEO Stockton Rush, who died in the sub-implosion, telling CBS last year, now At some point, safety just is pure waste. I mean, if you just want to be safe, don't get out of bed, don't get in your car, don't do anything. Adventure travel brought in more than $350 billion last year. But a $250,000 ticket to the Titanic is the outer fringe of that industry. The most popular forms of adventure travel are hiking and cycling. And in the U.S., adventure guides are tightly regulated. If you're going to be a mountaineering guide, you need to get certified by the American Mountain Guide Association or the International Mountain Guide Association. If you're offering raft trips, your team should be doing swift water rescue. But in the riskiest realms, regulation lags far behind. Welcome. 
into the new space age. Tech titans are already charging tens or hundreds of thousands for trips to space, but the FAA is prohibited by Congress from regulating the safety of people on board. And while a record number of permits have been issued for climbers of Mount Everest, that mountain is also largely unregulated. Even as a record 12 climbers and Sherpas died and another five disappeared there this year. But that does not hurt the appeal. People are strange, you know. There was the huge Everest disaster years ago. It did not dim the interest in Everest in the slightest. In fact, according to those who study tourism, after disasters like the Ocean Gate deaths, interest often grows. It will probably make it even more attractive. Um, people are attracted by danger. People are attracted by extreme forms of tourism in all shapes and forms. Will this stop people going down? No, it will probably attract even more people now. Ultimately, this form of tourism seems to have latched onto a quirk of human nature. In spite of a waiver obtained by TMZ that spelled out that the sub was uncertified and carried the risk of death in many forms, the passengers still signed on. NBC has not obtained or verified that waiver. Do you think people really understand the risk or do they just sign a form that says they do? For this particular case, I think they understand the risk because you, you know, you're going down deep, deep into the ocean. So I, I can't believe they don't really appreciate the risk that they're going into. Obviously, nobody ever thinks you're going to come to an end. I guess part of the challenge is we, we get a bit complacent. The excitement just takes over. Our thanks to Jake Ward for that report. One note on Congress blocking regulation on space travel. That moratorium expires in October, and some in the industry are debating whether it's time for Congress to add safety measures. Welcome back. Officials in Montana are continuing to investigate whether the Yellowstone River has been contaminated after a train carrying hazardous materials derailed over the weekend. On Saturday, a bridge collapsed, sending rail cars into the river. Now, it's not yet clear what happened first, the derailment or the collapse. It's also unclear what caused either accident. Officials say a number of the train cars in the river were carrying molten sulfur and asphalt. Two nearby towns, Billings and Laurel, Montana, shut down their water supply system shortly after the derailment. They have since been reopened. The National Transportation Safety Board is now investigating the incidents. Turning now to some troubling news off the coast of California. A mysterious algae bloom is killing off sea life by the hundreds. And now experts are warning that the toxic plants could impact your next seafood dinner. Here's NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson. The beauty of a California beach day broken by the startling sight of sickness and death. It has been quite uh, awful. We've uh, been seeing at least two or three of them wash up every evening. Scientists call it a microscopic menace, toxic algae blooms poisoning the California coast. Toxins build up in their system and uh, can lead to all sorts of issues. Along the Southern California coast, officials estimate more than a thousand calls for sea lions and dolphins, either dead or showing signs of sickness. It affects uh, the brains and the heart, um, can lead to seizures, can lead to disorientation, aggression, as well as uh, miscarriages and death. Biologists say it's likely a toxic algae bloom called pseudonychia, which can be eaten by small sea creatures, then turned into a neurotoxin when consumed by larger marine life. The Marine Mammal Care Center says there's been 50 rescues in the past two weeks alone. And behind me, another dolphin washed up on shore. Researchers now taking measurements, collecting samples, and waiting for test results to find out if it really is this algae. And if it is, it's more than just wildlife at risk. The California Department of Health warning against eating sport-harvested mussels, clams, or scallops from Santa Barbara County. I've never seen anything like this. To my recollection, this is uh, the largest pulse of, of animals that we've had, at least in the marine mammal uh, response side. Scientists scrambling for answers with wildlife rescue efforts around the clock. Steve Patterson, NBC News. Let's talk about something else that has a huge impact on our food, honeybees. One recent beekeeping survey found that last year, nearly half of their population died out. Now, experts say the bee mortality rate has fluctuated over the last few years, at times hitting troubling lows. Despite this, beekeepers have managed to keep the crucial population alive. For more, for more on how this was accomplished, we're joined by Jay Evans, who's a research entomologist with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Good to have you with us. So first of all, what is threatening these honeybees? and how are beekeepers managing to keep this population stable? 
Yeah, thank you. Well, the bees are facing threats both from their own diseases, uh, viruses, mites, bacteria. A lot of the things that you might think of for human health affect honeybees. Um, they're also under stress from climate differences and sort of moving across different climates. Um, but all of these issues have been dealt with by beekeepers for decades and decades. Um, beekeepers are excel at kind of nurturing their bees, getting them ready to pollinate crops and move them across country. And so what we're seeing now is just sort of uh, a, a, a tipping point with disease, we feel. There's a parasitic mite, actually, that crawls along the bees, bites into them, and transmits viruses. And, and that mite is getting increasingly hard to control. It, it um, can be controlled by management tools and breeding better bees, but uh, it's just voracious. It keeps growing and growing. And we think that's probably a major factor in these most recent winter losses, especially. So, Jay, for those who are wondering why we're having this conversation, help us understand just how important honeybees are agriculturally. Their impact is bigger than most of us realize, right? It sure is. Yeah, and all pollinators are important. There are bees, bats, some birds even are pollinators, but honeybees uh, for agriculture and, and in the environment are just so good at getting to crops, getting out among them, uh, doing their thing and coming home safely. And then the beekeeper, uh, many of whom are sort of these traveling uh, providers of agricultural services, uh, can take the box of bees and move to the next crop and do their thing again. So honeybees are really just the preeminent kind of traveling uh, service or service uh, insects for pollination. And that's a billion dollar industry for, for the US and many billions across the world. So their, their real strength is the ability to land at a site, do their thing, come back home to a box and um, be ready for the next job. So looking ahead, could we continue to see some of these low numbers that we've seen? And what can we do? Is there anything we can do to help make sure the bee populations don't drop this low again? Yeah, that's, that's great. And I, I do appreciate the interest in it, not just for the economy, but for what they do in nature. Uh, many people are turning towards uh, planting pollinator gardens uh, at a large scale, say along roadways, but also in your backyard. And that really helps honeybees, but also the many thousands of other bee species in the U.S. So, so looking at plants in your area that do well, especially ones that flower later in the summer when there might be um, a dearth of, of other uh, flowers and pollinate, pollen sources, that's always a good thing. Um, supporting your beekeepers, maybe supporting a local beekeeper, uh, buying local honey. Uh, if you have land, have crops, helping them safely put their bees on that land and, and do their thing. And, and keeping the environment clean, uh, no unnecessary use of pesticides and, um, you know, kind of keeping the habitat uh, wild in some ways as much as we can, even within urban settings, but it's been found to help. Some great advice there. I like buying local honey. Definitely going to do that one right there. Jay Evans, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Welcome back. Killer whales took aim at yet another boat off the coast of Spain. So what is behind this alarming aquatic trend? NBC's Maggie Vespa has the story. The latest deep sea scare with a trio of orcas targeting this Dutch yacht off the coast of Spain. Are you coming from the right Watch as the so-called killer whales circle the boat, then repeatedly ram its rudder. Oh my God. They're gonna get the rudder? The crew competing in a race Thursday along the Gibraltar Strait dropped their sails, slowing down. After 15 minutes, the orcas leave. No damage or injuries. It was a scary moment on board because, like, you don't have any control anymore over the rudders and the boat. And we know some incidents that the orcas uh, made some boats sink. This orca encounter part of a puzzling pattern, with one group near Spain nearly sinking this boat last month. In another video, you can see a whale chewing on a chunk of a boat. Experts say killer whale interactions have been on the rise since 2020, with more than 200 last year. And while Hollywood provides no shortage of stories about oceanic predators taking aim at humans... You don't consider these attacks. I don't. Real-life experts deem this trend a likely fluke. 
I think that one individual um, came into contact with the underside of a, of a sailboat, found it interesting or pleasurable, and other members of the population took up the uh, behavior. Oh my God. One theory behind a wave of whale run-ins. Maggie Vespa, NBC News. As we close out Pride Month this week, we're taking you to a sports bar in Oregon that's celebrating one year in business. The bar is the first of its kind to only show women's sports. NBC News correspondent Nyella Charles sat down with the owner to talk about her larger mission, campaigning for equality. Women's sports are the main attraction at the bar. That's why it's called the sports bra. But inside, it's an inclusive community led by its queer owner. At the sports bra in Portland, Oregon, it's all about support. Sports bras are optional, but women's sports are not. And acceptance isn't either. We don't have very many queer spaces or like queer safe spaces mm -hmm. that, are, that feel like they're made for us here or even in the entire country. This bar is the first to only air women's sports. Owner Jenny Nguyen came out to her parents when she was 17. For me, playing basketball was my safety blanket from having to come out. I got to the point where I remember when I was 17, I was like, I, I can't do this anymore. Um, kind of like that double life. And so I was laying in bed and I remember looking at my digital clock and it said like 10.58 at night. I go, okay, at 11.05, I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna go upstairs. I'm going to tell my parents I'm gay. Now this bar is a safe space for her and others. Yeah. What brought you here? Uh, the idea of coming and being able to watch sports with a room full of women and not having to battle with men to watch men's sports. <laughs> for the first time, this group of Seattle Storm fans can watch a game at a bar. To have a space that's showing stuff that specifically we are interested in is really special to have access to. They're big Jenny fans, too. I saw you over there, and I went, <laughs> <laughs> Across this bar, representation, while moving the conversation forward. We have a side of equity, and people can order that, add it to their tab, and at the end of the month or the week, I total it up and I donate all of it. During June and July, we're kind of focusing on transgender rights. Why is it important, especially now, to wrap your arms around that community? Trans women and girls are women and girls. And so we believe that everyone deserves a chance to participate in sports. It may be a sports bar, but what's happening here is bigger than sports. Gwynn started fundraising for the Voice of Sports Foundation side of equity campaign. It seeks to close the pay gap for female athletes. The foundation says all donations will be given to the athletes competing at this year's Women's World Cup. Back to you. All right, Nyella, thank you so much. Financial news now. Big oil taking a deep breath as that short-lived Russian mutiny calms. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other money headlines. Silvana, good morning. Hey, good morning to you. Yes, the so oil prices have been unsteady today, moving between losses and gains following that political turmoil in Russia this weekend. And traders say the situation doesn't appear to pose an immediate threat to oil supply from one of the world's largest producers. Goldman Sachs saying markets could price in a modestly higher chance of domestic volatility in Russia, leading to supply disruptions, but the impact could be limited. OPEC says the world will still need oil and refined products such as gasoline for the foreseeable future. The head of the cartel is saying today global oil demand will hit 110 million barrels per day in the next 20 years. Total energy demand is forecast to rise more than 20 percent from current levels. OPEC believes oil will remain nearly a third of the energy mix over the next few decades. And with many college graduates starting their first jobs, a new report from Bankrate ranks the best cities in the country to launch a career. Now, it ranks the top 50 metro areas based on categories such as job growth, cost of living, remote work, commute time, and the income rent gap. Now, Austin, Texas tops the list with favorable ratings in job growth and remote work. The South is actually home to half of the top 10 with Raleigh, Nashville, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Atlanta joining Austin. Joe. So right. how about that? There you go. Savannah, thank you so much. You got it. 
Welcome back. A new world's ugliest dog has been crowned. Scooter, a seven-year-old Chinese crested dog, took the title at the contest in Petaluma, California. He was born with a deformity that leaves his two hind legs facing backward and hardly any hair on his body. Our own NBC News Now anchor Gotti Schwartz helped judge this year's contest, which is designed to promote the importance of dog adoption. Gotti said of the winner, from the second he sits his hairless little booty and backward legs on your lap, you feel his warm, huggable power to change the meaning of the word ugly. Congratulations to Scooter, who's a good boy. There's no such thing as an ugly dog, by the way. They're all adorable. Before it even began, Taylor Swift's Eras Tour managed to break Ticketmaster. Well, now new research shows that the big effect that tour is having on economies, that includes spikes in labor near stadiums where she performs. So is it all good news for venues, or could it be a nightmare dressed as a daydream? Dr. Daniel Altman, chief economist at InstaWork, has investigated what he calls the Taylor Swift effect and joins us now. Good to have you with us, Dr. Altman. So let's talk about what you found in your research what exactly is the Taylor Swift effect? How does it work? Well, it's not too surprising that Taylor Swift would have a big effect on labor demand right in the stadium and right in the area around the stadium. We know that we're pulling in 60, 70, sometimes 80,000 people, sometimes even more in the parking lots. And so it's not surprising that on our platform, which helps businesses to connect with flexible workers across the country, we see a lot more demand for shifts around the stadium. But what we actually looked at was the area further away from the stadium, sort of a donut with the stadium taken out, going five mile radius outside of the stadium. And we found that even in that area, there was still up to a 500% increase in demand for flexible labor all the way across that area. And so it just shows that, especially when a stadium is in an urban area, Taylor Swift is bringing so many people into that area that she's making a huge effect on the local economy. So you mentioned specifically an urban area there, and that's interesting because you actually found a big difference in the impact of the tour in major cities versus small town locations. Tell us more about what that difference is and why you think the two are so different. Well, if we look at the big cities like Chicago, where Soldier Field is located near the center of town, where we look at Philadelphia, where Lincoln Financial Field is close to the center of town, in those places, there's a big effect on the local economy because there's so many bars and restaurants and hotels nearby. Those stadiums are kind of sticky. They, they keep people in that area to keep spending money. But if we look at Gillette Stadium in Foxborough, Massachusetts, or MetLife Stadium in East Rutherford, New Jersey. They're pretty far from the metropolitan centers, and there's not as much around to keep people in that area. People just go to the concert, they hang out at the stadium, and then they leave. And so the effect in those areas is much, much smaller, almost imperceptible. But if you have a stadium in a major city that's smack in the downtown area, it has a huge effect. All right, so I know you've studied Taylor Swift, but I do want to ask you a little bit about Beyonce. That's another megastar currently on tour overseas. Some experts believe her stop in Sweden actually affected that country's inflation rates just a little bit. So should we expect to see the Swift effect happen again when Beyonce starts touring here in America? Would we call that a, perhaps a, an economic renaissance? We're definitely going to be tracking Beyonce when she comes to the United States. What I can tell you is that when labor demand goes up, yes, it can push up hourly pay rates for those people, but it's usually a pretty temporary effect, and it's not something that is going to flow back into prices for the things that we buy every day across the country. So I'm not too worried about the inflation angle. All right. <laughs> but it will at least be a good time, and, and that's an inflation of fun. Let's just call it that, all right? <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Dr. Daniel Altman, fascinating conversation. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us. The news continues right now. Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment right now on Morning News Now. Rebellion and exile. New this morning, we're getting a look at Russia's defense minister. This video shows him for the first time since that short-lived uprising in Russia over the weekend aimed at ousting him from power and threatening Vladimir Putin's control over the country. The founder of the mercenary group that led the uprising was once part of Putin's elite. Now he's in exile in neighboring Belarus. It's all part of a cryptic deal brokered on behalf of a now-shaken Moscow. 
I think we've seen more cracks emerge in the, the Russian facade. We have all sorts of new questions that Putin is going to have to address in the weeks and months ahead. We've got team coverage on what it all means for Putin, as well as the man behind the rebellion and the war in Ukraine. This morning, major marine casualty. That's the Coast Guard's assessment of the loss, the Titan submersible, and now search and rescue efforts are officially ending this morning. But that's being replaced by a full international investigation into what caused the tragic loss of the vessel and those five men on board. We've got the latest on that investigation this morning, plus the ongoing efforts to recover that ill-fated vessel from the depths of the Atlantic. Also this morning, mall makeover, the unbeatable convenience of online shopping, has been steadily emptying out the humble shopping mall for years. But now some are being completely reinvented with a focus on community over commerce. And leave it to Beaver. It is an obsession that's uniquely American. Anybody living below the Mason-Dixon line will tell you Bucky's is almost synonymous with the South. And with the grand opening of its newest Tennessee location, the famous gas station chain takes a bite out of a world record. One of my favorite places on the planet. Looking forward to that. We begin this hour, though, with the weekend that shook Moscow. This morning, the Russian capital is on edge following that aborted mutiny by the mercenary Wagner Group. The extraordinary events of the last 48 hours saw President Putin and the Kremlin stare down one of the biggest threats they faced in decades. In a deal brokered by Belarus, the Wagner Group halted an unprecedented march toward Moscow following a major feud with the country's top military brass. The group had also briefly taken over the southern Russian city of Rostov-on-Don. This morning, Moscow is attempting to project a message of business as usual, releasing this video of the Russian defense minister meeting troops fighting in Ukraine. But it remains unclear when or where the pictures were taken. In a few moments, we will hear from the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, John Herbst, and NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea, who is in Kiev. But let's get straight to our chief international correspondent, Kier Simmons, who is in Moscow. Kier, good morning. Joe, good morning to you. It is surreal to stand here above the streets of Moscow and see how life seems so ordinary. A terror alert that had been imposed here in Moscow has been lifted after a rebellion that rocked Russia and even threatened this city. Overnight, Joe, we've learned that President Biden spoke to President Zelensky as events unfolded over the weekend. But honestly, both men and the world was left to watch from the sidelines. Reasserting authority, or trying to, this morning, new video of Russia's defense minister, the man who faced a mutiny this weekend, pictured overseeing the Ukraine operation. Sergei Shoigu also controls Russia's nuclear arsenal. The video is mute and doesn't say when it was filmed. Other images have not been widely broadcast here. Russians in the city of Rostov-on-Don cheering for the leader of this weekend's aborted rebellion, even taking selfies with Yevgeny Prigozhin. His insurrection bringing the country to the brink of chaos, his mercenary troops closing in on the capital, Moscow. Before an unprecedented deal with President Putin, brokered by another president, Belarus leader Alexander Lukashenko, apparently allowing the man behind the insurrection to go unpunished and into exile. Overnight, Russian TV commentators declaring a senseless massacre was avoided with maturity. Beijing saying this morning it supports Russia maintaining national stability, while the US and Ukraine sensing weakness at the heart of the Kremlin. I think we've seen more cracks emerge in the, the Russian facade. It is too soon to tell exactly where they go. Some commentators in Russia are calling for the mutiny leaders to be punished, even executed, pointing to President Putin's reputation for not easily forgiving betrayal. Prigozhin kept his life but lost his Wagner group, uh, and he should be very careful around open windows in his new surroundings uh, in Belarus. All that's left behind in Rostov-on-Don, occupied by the rebel group for less than a day, tank tracks and questions. <laughs> How can one, in a situation where we are in conflict with another country, have an internal war as well, this man says. Vladimir Putin's power challenged like never before. On Saturday, the president called it a stab in the back. How will he and Russia respond now? 
An NBC News has learned that U.S. intelligence, Joe, was aware that Bogosian was planning a confrontation with Russian military leaders. But what happens now, frankly, that is anyone's guess. All right, Kier Simmons reporting from Moscow. Kier, thank you so much. Our coverage continues now in Ukraine with NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobea in Kyiv. Kelly, good morning. So the big question right now is how is this going to impact the war in Ukraine more than a year old? How are Ukrainian officials reacting to this drama that played out over the weekend within Russia? Well, President Zelensky, along with uh, many of his advisors, have been talking about this, have been tweeting about it over the past several days, ever since the, the rebellion started playing out on television screens, the world watching. Of course, Ukraine has been watching. President Zelensky has called this chaos. He said the bosses in Russia aren't in control. He said that... Um, this is a sign of weakness in Russia. He said the longer the Russian aggression lasts, the more degradation it causes Russia itself. At one point, he even addressed uh, Russians in their own language, saying, uh, as long as you stay with Putin, this is what you will get, disaster after disaster. So very much playing uh, the information uh, fight, very much getting into that uh, propaganda warfare, uh, trying to get his me message across to the to the. Russian people. But on the same, uh, at the same time, there is also a, an ongoing fight here in Ukraine. There's been no pause along the 600 mile uh, front line of this war. Uh, and, and the question among on many people's minds is how will, will this affect the front line? And that's something that, that we're watching as well, Joe. Yeah, Kelly, I mean, so I mean, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said it was extraordinary to see the Wagner forces moving out of Ukraine and into Russia. This is all playing out amid Ukraine's massive counteroffensive. So in light of this internal Russian fight, I know it's only been a couple days now, but do we know if Ukrainian forces have been able to make any headway on the battlefield? Well, the deputy uh, defense minister said they they absolutely have. In fact, just a short time ago, she said that uh, the Ukrainian forces had taken yet another village, the ninth village since their offensive began. She said that they've uh, taken about 50 square miles of territory from the Russians on the southern front. She said that that front has changed quite a bit over the course of the past week. Uh, we've also been talking to the spokesperson for uh, the forces on the eastern front, and he said... This doesn't change things on a tactical sense. What it changes is the morale of those fighters uh, in the East. They will have been listening to uh, those telegram channels, the social media. They'll know what is going on, and that will have an effect on how they fight going forward. Of course, Joe, we'll have to see. All right, Kelly Kobie, a reporting from Ukraine's capital. Kelly, thank you so much. Let's bring in the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, John Herbst. Ambassador, good to have you with us. So, I mean, we know Russia has always prided itself on this image of being strong, stable, having predictable leadership. Have this weekend's events tarnished that? I mean, what is your reaction to what's been going on here? Uh, this weekend's events prove that Putin the strong man is not quite Putin the strong man. Uh, the most effective uh, military force in, U in Russia was not only coming to get rid of the chief of staff of the military and the defense minister, but its leader was saying that the war on Ukraine was on pretexts which were not true. So directly challenging the Kremlin narrative, this was all about responding to Western aggression, demonstrating that Putin's power is really a suspect. So, Ambassador, we know tensions between the Wagner Group and Moscow's military leaders. They've been brewing for some time. Why do you think this mutiny happened now, and what does it tell us about Putin's grip on power? Prigozhin has been slamming the defense minister and General Gerasimov since the success of Ukraine's counteroffensive last year became apparent in late September or October. And he also began to question, albeit with real nuance, indirectly, the way the war was handled, and also the justification for the war. I believe that Wagner or Prigozhin struck now because of the deadline given by the authorities in Moscow that all Wagner soldiers would have to sign a contract and be under the control of the Ministry of Defense. The deadline for that was July 1. And so I think Prigozhin responded to that.
So going forward, I mean, do you think this deal between the Wagner Group and Moscow is going to hold? Will Prigozhin be allowed much freedom and influence? Um, Putin will keep Prigozhin in a box. Um, will Putin, excuse me, will Prigozhin agree to stay in the box? We'll see. Many people speculate that Putin needs to actually arrange the demise of, of Prigozhin because he called him a traitor and then said he can go, demonstrating weakness. The problem for that with Putin is Prigozhin has great, has great legitimacy in Russia. People would understand that Putin did that. So Putin has to tread carefully in his treatment of Prigozhin. All right, Ambassador Herbst, great to have your expertise on this story. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. The U.S. Coast Guard is launching an investigation into what caused the Titan submersible to implode. All five people on board were killed while heading to a tour of the Titanic shipwreck. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa joins us now with the latest on the investigation. Emily, good morning. Hey there, Joe. So the U.S. Coast Guard leading that investigation into what they are calling a major marine casualty. The board can recommend pursuing civil or criminal actions. The NTSB also investigating as the submersible's experimental design is coming under growing scrutiny. With the multinational inquiry already underway, this morning, the U.S. Coast Guard says it's convening a Marine Board of Investigation, its highest investigative body, to figure out what caused the deep-sea disaster involving the Titanic touring submersible Titan. The board will first and primarily work to determine the cause of this marine casualty and the five associated deaths. It can make recommendations to the proper authorities to pursue civil or criminal sanctions as necessary. Authorities say they're reviewing data and voice recorders from the mothership, Polar Prince, which chartered the sub out to its launch point, and conducting interviews with crew members. Pelagic Research Services, who helped in the attempted rescue effort, sharing these images of its remotely operated vehicle, Odysseus, from a recent dive. The company calling the Titan recovery missions remarkably difficult and risky. Now, experts are focusing on the submersible's carbon fiber hull amid allegations that its owner, Stockton Rush, who was among the five killed in the underwater disaster, apparently ignored repeated warnings about the vessel. The company, which is closed indefinitely, says they have no additional information to share at this time. They didn't have any external uh, bodies, governmental, otherwise overseeing what they're doing. The mother of Suleiman Dawood, the teenager who died with his father, Shazada, in the Titan, opening up overnight, saying she was originally supposed to be in the sub instead of her son. It was supposed to be Shazada and I going down. Um, and but then I stepped back and gave the space to Suleiman because he really wanted to go. Christine Dawood also remembering her last moments with them. We just hugged and joked, actually, because... Shazada was so excited to go down. He was like a little child. I miss them. And I really, really miss them. And you can imagine the heartbreak. Investigating officials say there were 41 people on board the support ship Polar Prince when it set sail on June 18th, including some family members of the victims, like Christine Dawood, who, who you just heard from there. Interviews with those on board already underway by authorities. The U.S. Coast Guard says a key goal of its investigation is making recommendations to improve safety on the water worldwide. And the investigation is going to take quite some time, right? Absolutely. All right, yeah. Emily, thank you so much. Thanks, Joe. In Pennsylvania, the trial for the Tree of Life synagogue shooter is entering the penalty phase this morning. The jury will decide whether 50-year-old Robert Bowers gets life in prison without the possibility of parole or the death penalty. Earlier this month, that same jury found Bowers guilty of 63 criminal counts, including multiple hate crimes. 11 people were killed in the 2018 shooting, making it the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in American history. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now to discuss the next stage of the trial. Danny, good morning. So first of all, how does this penalty phase compare to the actual trial? What are going to be the, the big differences here? The biggest difference in a federal capital case and most state cases is that unlike a normal non-capital case, the jury decides the penalty, not the judge. In every other federal case, it is the judge that decides the punishment. But in a federal capital case, the jury has a binary decision to make, yay or nay on death. It's either death or it's life in prison. And so Everything in a capital sentencing phase uh, in the federal system is about aggravation and mitigation. By now, the government has already given the defense what it thinks are the aggravating factors that weigh in favor of death. And now the defense team's sole job 
at this stage is to come up with as many mitigating factors, positive factors about their client as they can. Maybe that's developmental disabilities, any reasons that they can put before the court, the jury, to say that this is a life worth saving. It is a difficult, unenviable place to be for a defense team, especially in a case like this. So, Danny, who are we expecting to take the stand in this phase of the trial? What is some of the testimony that the jury could hear? The jury's going to hear all kinds of different mitigation evidence that the defense is going to try to crowbar in. And strangely enough, there are some limitations, but the rules here get a little relaxed. Expect to hear from witnesses that will talk about uh, this defendant's life, uh, challenges that he has had. You, you will see on certain medical evidence to that or maybe even psychological evidence uh, that he has uh, suffered for, from some kind of disability, some kind of problem that makes this a mitigating factor. But look, the prosecution here has already proven, in a sense, a lot of their aggravating factors, one of which is, for example, that this uh, crime was motivated by hate hatred of Jewish people, hatred of people uh, engaging in religious expression. So in a sense, in the guilt phase, they've already, the government's already proven a lot of the things that they need that the jury's already heard. And remember, this is a jury that is not coming with a clean slate to the penalty phase. They've had to sit through horrific testimony. So this is an uphill battle for the defense, to be sure. For my next question, a little background here. Before the trial, Bauer's lawyers did offer a plea deal to try and resolve the case. They offered a guilty plea on all counts in exchange for life in prison without the possibility of release. Federal prosecutors rejected that offer. We know they're seeking the death penalty here. Is that common in a case like this? I mean, yes, you can infer that the only reason we're even having a trial in a case like this is probably because the government rejected an offer to plea. I mean, make no mistake about it. The, the defense team here, by all indications, no one was trying to pull out a victory. No one was trying to say, are you sure that you saw my client in this uh, it, with the firearm? Is it, are you sure this is the guy? There was never any of that. This entire defense plan from the beginning has been mitigation. Uh, there was virtually no cross-examination, no defense put on. This is all about saving this defendant's life if they can do it. And so uh, that's what a lot of cap federal capital practice is about. It's not about trying to win. Uh, that is not going to happen. It's about the end game, which is if you can save this defendant's life against overwhelming odds, because it's probably not going to happen. Yeah, so quickly, Danny, what's the timeline then for this phase? It could be. Uh, I mean, I'm sure they've already budgeted a time. That budget often gets exceeded. Uh, in a high-profile case, I always say add a few more days. Uh, it might take a week. Uh, this is where you will see the defense put on witnesses, whereas the guilt phase, they put on virtually no defense. You're going to see a defense here. In fact, this is where the work really begins. Believe me, the defense team, a capital mitigation team, has a lot of extra folks who come in to assist the defense in preparing mitigation and even testifying about mitigation. All right, Danny Savalos, thank you so much. Turning now to the deadly severe weather in the South and the Midwest. Folks in the South are trying to keep cool in the sweltering heat. As temperatures in several states continue to hit triple digits with no sign of relief in sight. In Big Bend National Park, the National Park Service says a 14 year old boy got sick lost consciousness, and died Saturday while hiking. Temperatures there hit nearly 120 degrees. Officials say the boy's stepfather rushed to try and find help and was found dead after his car crashed over an embankment. The Park Service is investigating those deaths. And people in parts of the Midwest are cleaning up this morning after getting pummeled with severe storms over the weekend. Multiple tornadoes were reported in Indiana and Minnesota. One person was killed in Indiana after a tornado there collapsed, caused a home to collapse. Let's get a look at what you can expect this week with your morning news now weather forecast. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman is here. Michelle, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Great to see you. And unfortunately, we're going to see more of the same. We're going to see that repeat performance. We're into our third week of this dangerous heat in the south, and we've had day after day of this severe weather risk. We're going to see it once again today. We're watching storms early this morning as we're looking at portions of the southeast, and we will see the east coast being the target for the storms as we go throughout today. So taking a quick look, a quick look at the week ahead,
and then we'll get into the stories here. We have that sweltering heat continue, temperature soaring once again into the triple digits. It'll feel like 110 to 120 in spots. We're wet on the West Coast, cool in portions of the West as well. And then the East Coast is wet as well. So we're looking at portions of the Great Lakes into the Ohio Valley, the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic down to the Southeast. We're looking at showers and some storms. And some of these storms could be gusty, especially in the Mid-Atlantic down to the Carolinas. By Wednesday, still more wet weather in portions of the Northeast, New England. It's going to be cool and wet in New England. Record heat continues on Wednesday. We do have some rain in the forecast for the Northern Plains, parts of the upper Midwest. Also the inner Mountain West, sun and clouds in the Southwest. And then Friday, kind of staying with this same pattern with no heat relief in the South. Still looking at temperatures really warm from the Southwest, the Southern Plains into the Southeast. Chance for storms still in the inner Mountain West, parts of the Central Plains, parts of the Midwest, the Ohio Valley, and also parts of the uh, Mid Mid Atlantic to the Northeast and also New England. So a lot of the same stories as we go throughout this work week. This is the reason why we have the jet stream sort of kind of cutting off the country into two pieces here. We have an area of low pressure spinning over the Great Lakes. That's bringing a cold front into parts of the east. That's where we're going to see the severe weather and seeing some heavy downpours as well. Down to the south, we have an area of high pressure. It's sort of like a heat pump. It's just pumping in that really dangerous hot air. It's pumping in some moisture, too. So we're going to take those temperatures, add some humidity to it, and that's where we're feeling like 110 to 120. So as far as the heat alerts go, 33 million people impacted by a heat alert. We do have that pink. That's your excessive heat warning, and this is why. Temperatures once again into the triple digits in so many spots. 106 in Abilene, it's going to feel like 109. It'll feel like 111 in Dallas. Same story in Houston feeling like 110 in Shreveport and it's warm too in New Orleans. You will feel like 111 there. And unfortunately this is going to continue throughout the week. We're looking at temperatures still in the triple digits Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in Houston. Dallas we're looking at 107 on Wednesday. As far as that severe weather threat, millions and millions, 58 million people at risk. Four severe storms today. Where you see that orange color, that's your enhanced risk. That is most likely where we're going to see the strongest storms. Philadelphia to D.C., Richmond also Raleigh. Now, the takeaways is we're looking at the chance for really gusty winds. That's the strongest impact with winds gusting over 65 miles per hour. Some really large hail as well. Could see a tornado or two is possible, but also looking at heavy rain. So we had some really heavy downpours yesterday. I live in Doyle, sound in Bucks County. We had like a deluge of storms. And so we're going to see those pop-up storms. That could lead to some flash flooding as well. All right. I know you keep an eye on it. By the way, yeah. we want to talk about some good news in the South. Yes. Michelle, do you know what this is? I heard the out there you and heard. I want to go. You, I need is, to go with this you. This is the shirt for Bucky's, <laughs> which is, it's not enough to call it a gas station. It's, it's like Candyland. It's everything. It's like a department store. I need There's beef to jerky. Go. It, it is so much fun. So we're back now with the race for president, a new NBC News poll that shows despite former President Donald Trump's legal troubles, his lead is growing against his Republican rivals for president. The poll also gives us a look ahead to November next year and the possibility of another close election. NBC's Garrett Haig joins us from Washington with the latest. Garrett, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. This Republican race in 2024 is really starting to pick up steam. We got another new candidate in the race last week. We had the first big multi-candidate confab here in Washington over the weekend. And while the 2024 race is taking on a life of its own, it's also starting to look a lot like the 2016 race, with Donald Trump opening up a big lead over his rivals and the rest of the field scrambling to find some way to try to stop him. Donald Trump this weekend expanding his lead over the Republican primary field while mocking his closest competitor, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. He's falling like a rock. People are getting to know him. They know he's got no personality. Got to have a little personality. Not much, but a little. 51% of Republican primary voters surveyed tell NBC News they prefer Mr. Trump, with Mr. DeSantis following at 22% and former Vice President Mike Pence in third at 7%. Five other candidates trail in the low single digits. Mr. Trump's support only growing among Republican voters since his historic second indictment after he was arraigned in federal court earlier this month on charges he illegally kept classified documents, then obstructed the government's efforts to get them back. The former president marveling at his good fortune at a conservative conference Saturday. I'm probably the only person in history in this country that's been indicted and my numbers went up. Most other candidates attempting to tout their conservative credentials. I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order. But I do believe this moment the life of our nation will require new leadership in the Republican Party and in the White House. 
while former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie was booed for taking on the GOP frontrunner directly. Unwilling to take responsibility for any of the mistakes that were made, any, uh, any of the faults that he has, and any of the things that he's done. And that is not leadership, everybody. That is a failure of leadership. And I, you can boo all you want. But the same NBC News poll also shows the challenge Mr. Trump would face if he does win the GOP nomination. In a hypothetical 2020 general election rematch against President Biden, the president leads Mr. Trump 49 to 45, presenting the possibility of another nail biter in November. And Joe, it's shaping up to be a pretty busy week on the campaign trail in both parties. Ron DeSantis is at the Texas-Mexico border today. He's expect to un expected to unveil his uh, immigration plan there, a big issue in the Republican primary. And President Biden's on the road. On Wednesday, he's going to give a major speech on the economy in Chicago, hoping to run on his economic credentials. And Joe, if you'll allow me a point of personal privilege, I'm as a Texan, I'm very into the Bucky's segment. I even got my daughter a tiny Bucky's onesie before she was even born. Is we're here for it. You know all about you. Have you had the cream cheese jalapeno dip there? Have I? Yes. yes that right. is a necessary yeah. staple when driving hundreds of miles back and <laughs> forth across the state of Texas. Absolutely. Love it. Garrett, thank you so much. We're talking more about a point that Garrett just mentioned. One of Trump's rivals, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, is in Texas this morning as his campaign moves into high gear. He's touring the southern border ahead of the rollout of his immigration platform. We are expected to learn more about that later today. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez is there. He joins us from Eagle Pass, Texas, with more. So, Gabe, you know, we know DeSantis toured the border yesterday. What was he trying to accomplish? What's his message as he tries to boost those low poll numbers we just heard about? Uh, hi there, Joe. Good morning. Well, I must say, first, I do concur with Garrett. I'm a big Bucky's fan. But also here in Texas, the Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will be here, uh, has been here toward this area late last night. This is his second trip to the border this month. His first one was to Arizona. That one, though, was an official state visit. This is being billed as a campaign stop where he plans to roll out that immigration policy that Garrett just mentioned. Now, a campaign spokesperson also tells me that he is now shifting his strategy in the coming weeks, going from touting his success in Florida to now taking sharper aim at what the campaign sees as the failures of the Biden administration. But immigration, of course, has been a top issue in this G GOP primary. And look for Governor DeSantis in the coming weeks to tout his record on immigration heavily. Again, we expect more details on that plan to be rolled out later this morning. So, Joe? Gabe, you know, DeSantis had previously sent Florida personnel to the border to help Texas deal with the migrant influx. You've reported numerous times from the border over the years. What is the situation looking like there right now? Well, certainly, Joe, critics of the Biden administration had said for quite a while that with the ending of Title 42, of course, you'll remember that's that pandemic era COVID border restriction that uh, made it harder for the U.S. to expel migrants. When that lapsed, critics of the Biden administration warned of a huge influx here at the southern border. Now, it did uh, increased just a bit for several days, but then the numbers went down. And actually, from April to May, the overall number of Southwest border encounters actually dropped by 25%, leading to critics of Ron DeSantis saying, why did he send uh, teams from Florida, Florida taxpayer money, here to the southern border? Now, I toured part of the border uh, from a Texas DPS chopper yesterday, and I asked one of those Texas DPS officials what he would say, and, and you know, also, how have those Florida teams actually impacted uh, the border here. Take a listen. What do you say to critics who may look at the Florida teams that are coming over here and think, look, why, why is a Florida team coming all the way from a different state to help here in Texas? What would you tell somebody who makes that point? I would tell those people that uh, you know, they don't live here, they don't see the amount of people that are coming across, they don't see the crime that has risen. Still, that official did acknowledge that there has been a drop in unauthorized border crossings since Title 42 ended, Jeff. And quickly, Gabe, what else is on DeSantis's agenda today while in Texas? Well, he also plans to speak at a VFW hall, uh, hall here, speaking with voters. And again, uh, around 11 o'clock Eastern times, he plan plans to hold a press conference where he'll roll out that immigration policy proposal. And we also do expect him to try to distinguish himself from former President Trump 
It's expected that the Trump campaign will likely make the point that it has been making before, that a lot of these immigration policies were actually copied from the Trump administration, Joe. All right, Dave, thank you so much. To international headlines now, starting with a deadly roller coaster accident in a Swedish amusement park. NBC's Claudia Lavanga has more on that in other world headlines. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joel. Yes, at least one person has died and several others, including children, are injured in that roller coaster accident or incident. Now, it happened yesterday at the Grona Amusement Park in Stockholm. Witnesses say the ride called the jet line derailed, sending victims crashed into the ground. About 14 people were on the ride at that time. The park was evacuated after the incident. Those victims are now being treated at a nearby hospital. Now, let's head over to North Korea, where we are seeing mass anti U.S. rallies. Over 120,000 people gathered in the West Central Park part of North Korea for the 73rd anniversary of the start of the Korean War. People held signs saying things like the whole U.S. mainland is within our shooting range. This comes as Kim Jong-un continues his controversial nuclear weapons and missiles programs. Now we end with a little southern charm in Ireland. Big blonde wigs took over the small town looking to set the world record for the largest gathering of Dolly Partons in a public space. But making history like this comes with some rules. According to the Guinness World Record guidelines, participants have to be instantly recognizable as the country music star. And the costumes have to be inspired by an outfit she has worn in the past. They need a minimum of 250 to hit their goal, but this town is no stranger to world records. They actually broke one already when over 1,400 people dressed as whiskey-sipping nuns back in 2012. That looks like a fun, hell of a fun town. Yeah, <laughs> definitely is. How do you judge instantly recognizable? That seems incredibly subjective to me. All right. <laughs> but... No. Claudio, thank you so much. Appreciate it. A 13-year-old boy is recovering this morning after being attacked by an alligator while swimming in a Florida creek. The gator latched onto the teen's leg, making it the latest in a string of close calls involving alligators over the last week. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has the latest from South Florida. This is the kind of situation that would make any parent's heart skip a beat. Gabriel Clemis was just trying to cool off in a creek about 20 minutes north of Orlando when he felt the jaws of an alligator lock into his leg and try to pull him underneath the water. Now, Gabriel bravely fought back, punching the alligator on the head several times before breaking free. He's now at home, recovering from this frightening ordeal. Gabriel Clemis is a regular at Howell Creek in Winter Springs, Florida, and didn't think twice about grabbing a rope swing and jumping into the water on a sweltering summer day last Tuesday. But that swim with his younger brother took a terrifying turn when a gator grabbed onto his leg and wouldn't let go. The gator kind of just grabbed me from there, and then he just, like, once he wrapped his, like, jaws on me, I knew that there was, like, no getting out. Gabriel says he fought back, repeatedly punching the alligator in the head. I just like hit it with my hand and like I just like kind of just like took like a bare like fist and then I just hit it on its like I tried to hit it on his head. Incredibly, the reptile let go and Gabriel was able to swim back to shore. The 13 year old went to a nearby house where he calmly called his mom and then 911. I just got bit by a gator. Okay. And what part of your body was bit? Oh, uh, like my my right hip. I'm okay, though. I can walk and I can stand. I'm, I'm fine. Okay, I have the paramedics on the way. Once at the hospital, Gabriel received stitches for the wound and a bandage from his hip to his upper thigh, even snapping this photo from his hospital bed. While the teenager is home now, he's not completely out of the woods yet. Huge concern for infection. We talked with infectious disease. They said about 10 days. So we're really out of the woods just because of how deep the wound was and the creek water. Florida Fish and Wildlife trapped a large eight-foot alligator a few days later in that same area. They say they're fairly confident it's the same one that bit Gabriel, but there's no way to be 100% sure. Meanwhile, further up the coast in South Carolina. Look, here he comes. This alligator popped out of a pond last week in Hilton Head and tried to chase down a fisherman in the low country. No one was injured, but a spokesperson from the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources explained it's likely the alligator associates people with food after being fed in the past, putting an exclamation point on a week of chilling gator encounters. 
Florida Fish and Wildlife estimates that in the state's 67 counties, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.3 million alligators. Now, before you get too worried, they said that unprovoked attacks like these are extremely rare. Over the course of the last decade, the state has averaged about eight a year. You just don't want to be one of those eight requiring medical attention. In Miami, Sam Brock, NBC News. Back to you. All right. Thanks, Sam. We're back with new details in the case against the man suspected of murdering four University of Idaho students last year. Lawyers for Brian Koberger say DNA from another man was found at the crime scene, throwing his involvement into question. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin has more on these latest developments. Hey there, a flurry of new court documents have been released ahead of a court hearing tomorrow where Koberger's legal team will argue for access to the grand jury materials that led to his indictment last month. Koberger's lawyers have asked the judge to halt proceedings until they have what they say they need to build their case. Counts two, three, four, and five, murder in the first degree. A legal battle over evidence playing out between Brian Koberger working to clear his name in the murder of four University of Idaho students and the state fighting to prove his guilt. In new court documents, Koberger's attorney accusing the state of hiding its entire case by seeking to protect information about the genetic genealogy investigation they say led them to Koberger. The state here is using a relatively new kind of DNA technology. So this is exactly the kind of thing the defense will argue that they need, because if this is emerging technology, they need all the facts they can if they're going to challenge it. In a court filing earlier this month, prosecutors said that Koberger's DNA is a statistical match to DNA found on the knife sheath at the scene of the murders last November. In the filing, Koberger's lawyer said that two additional males' DNA was found within the house, as well as another unknown male's DNA on a glove found outside the house, days after the murder. Koberger's attorney also writing that police were investigating many various possible suspects, adding that many of them provided DNA and at least one had his DNA surreptitiously taken from a discarded cigarette. The judge entered a not guilty plea for Koberger after he opted to stand silent at his arraignment. He's accused of murdering Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonzalez, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin as they slept in an off-campus home in Moscow, Idaho on November 13th. An expansive gag order has blanketed the case since January, challenged by both the media and one of the victim's family's lawyers. On Friday, the judge upheld the gag order but narrowed it, allowing attorneys in the case to comment on matters like scheduling and correcting misinformation about their client. Tomorrow, both sides will face off in court again. As Koberger's lawyers argue for the release of materials, they say they need to defend the suspected killer. Koberger's lawyer also went even further in the court filing, saying there is no connection between Mr. Koberger and the victims. There is no explanation for the total lack of DNA evidence from the victims in Mr. Koberger's apartment, office, home, or vehicle. Back to you. All right, Aaron McLaughlin, thank you. A new declassified government report is shedding light on the investigation into the origins of the coronavirus. The 10-page document revealed that government agencies remain divided over how COVID-19 began. The National Intelligence Council and four unnamed agencies believe it's most likely the virus came from an exposure to an infected animal. But the DOE and the FBI say a possible lab leak is more likely. The CIA was unable to determine the virus's origin. The agencies were able to agree that the coronavirus was not engineered to be a biological weapon. The report also looked into the condition of the Wuhan lab leading up to the COVID pandemic. The results of the investigation found little evidence that supports or disproves the theories about the pandemic's origin. We're back with video showing the chaos aboard a cruise ship after a sudden gust of wind took the boat by surprise. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas has the incredible pictures. Passengers speaking out after these terrifying moments on a Royal Caribbean cruise ship hit by a freak storm while departing from a port in Florida as high winds turned furniture into projectiles. You can see here a lounge chair falling from a top deck, smashing into a stroller below. The woman running away with a child in her arms. The company says a sudden gust of wind slammed it during departure from Port Canaveral on June 16th. Passenger Jennifer Stansill was in the middle of the chaos. Chair started flying, towels started flying, people started scrambling. It happened 
so quick. <gasps> Those chairs are flying. Royal Caribbean says no one was seriously injured. I'm still going to cruise. I still love it. Oh, oh my God, that a freak storm putting passengers in danger and casting a shadow over a sunny summer vacation. Guad Venegas, NBC News, Miami. Now to some financial headlines, YouTube could be expanding to online video games. CNBC's Silvana Hanau is back with that and other financial headlines. Silvana, good morning. Hey Joe, good morning. Yeah, so YouTube is testing a product for playing online games, signaling efforts to move beyond hosting videos to games that can easily be played and shared. Now, the Wall Street Journal reports that YouTube's parent company, Google, recently invited employees to start testing the product called Playables. Now, it gives users access to games on mobile devices or desktop computers, and they can play games instantly via YouTube's website, on web browsers, or the YouTube app on devices running Android and Apple's iOS software. Where James Bond's next car might be electric. Aston Martin is teaming up with Lucid to manufacture high performance electric vehicles. Lucid will supply the British luxury automaker with powertrain parts for future battery electric vehicle models. Aston Martin is targeting the launch of its first battery electric vehicle in 2025. And Netflix says a staggering 60% of subscribers are or have watched a Korean show or movie on the platform. The company's co-CEO, Ted Sarandos, unveiled that stat at a forum in Seoul. And he's in South Korea to meet with production partners and government officials, including the prime minister. And he says viewing of K-content is up sixfold globally in just the past four years. After Squid Game became a worldwide hit, other Korean shows are also gaining fans like The Glory and All of Us Are Dead Joe. That's cool to see. All right, Savannah, yeah. thank you so much. Sure thing. For decades, the modern day shopping mall played a central, almost mythical role in many of our lives. Well, now some struggling malls are reinventing themselves and looking to connect with the community. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung reports. It's a wild thought. Come to the Westfield Mall in Annapolis looking for shoes, and you might leave with a new feline friend or two. They're bonded, so you need to take both it's, of it's, them. It's a, it's a deal. It's a package deal. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Kelly Brown helped open not a pet store, but an animal shelter at the mall during the pandemic. Since then, Paws of the Mall has found forever homes for some 1,600 rescue animals. When you walk by, there might just be that one special animal that catches your eye. Like the stores love it too. The shelter says foot traffic on this side of the mall has jumped 10% since they moved in. They're paying rents and filling empty space. The animal shelter here at the mall is what used to be a clothing brand Quicksilver location, and it's right across from what's now a library. It used to be a clothing brand store, Charlotte Russe, and an American Eagle. It's not a bookstore, but a public library. There's books for all ages, toys and play spaces for the kids too. A lot of stores are closing, so I think having uh, Anne Arundel County Public Library come in here has really revitalized this mall specifically. Branch manager Rachel Myers says it goes both ways. They're coming to the mall for so many other things, and they're becoming library users all the time, and that's really what we want is creating more library customers. Nationwide, about a tenth of mall space is currently empty, so they're turning to unconventional solutions. The future could look like Main Street, but inside, says expert Alexandra Lang. You're going to see a lot more entertainment businesses, like movie theaters, VR theaters, trampoline parks, maybe pickleball, climbing walls, other active uses. It's happening already. In New Jersey, a Burlington coat factory is now a pickleball court. And in Idaho, the old Sears department store is now a charter school. The auto shop turned into a basketball court. All of it seamlessly embedded inside the Grand Teton Mall. I think really the way to think about the mall of the future is what things make people leave their houses. Brown says she's fielding calls from other shelters around the country. They want to try the mall too. It's a win for the mall, it's a win for us, and especially for the animals. An adorable solution that anyone could get behind. Brian Chung, NBC News, Annapolis. Welcome back. Thousands marched down Fifth Avenue yesterday as confetti rained down upon New York City's 53rd annual Pride March. Parades were also held in Chicago and San Francisco. In all, around 400 events took place across the U.S. Many of this year's parades called for LGBTQ communities to unite against anti-LGBTQ legislation that was passed or introduced in state houses. 
across the country. Finally this hour, crowds of folks are gathering in East Tennessee for a supersized grand opening. The gas station chain Bucky's is unveiling what could be the largest gas station in the world. But it's so much more than a gas station. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is there and has this exclusive tour. Kathy, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning to you. Yeah, if you've driven across the southeast or Texas, you probably stopped at one of these, at Bucky's. And as you said, it's more than just a gas station. Yes, you can fuel up, but where can you also pick up beaver nuggets? a brisket sandwich and Joe it's bathing suit season you can also get one of these as well and this morning folks from all across the country have stopped by to check this all out this morning the largest gas station in the world is open for business right next door to the Great Smoky Mountains the newest Bucky's in Sevierville Tennessee is supersized spanning 74,000 square feet with 120 gas pumps more than 350 employees and a larger than life beaver mascot that can be seen for miles on the interstate y'all Bucky's is the Mecca of the South. Born in Texas in 1982, the Bucky's chain expanded across the South, becoming a freeway phenomenon, offering travelers more than just a spot to fuel up. Let's see what all the fuss is about. <laughs> what in the Walmart gas station? Y'all, I think I'm in love. What's the best way to describe Bucky's? Well, Bucky's is a travel destination. According to a recent survey, these days many consumers are taking their time to enjoy the amenities that gas chains have to offer, spending anywhere between between 16 to 24 minutes per stop and some will even drive up to 20 minutes out of their way to visit a favorite station cleanliness prices food quality and customer service keep them coming back let's give it up for angela Angela calls herself a true Southern girl and is now bringing years of experience in the kitchen to Bucky's. My grandmother taught me to make all the good homemade fudge. Her co-worker Mindy worked 16 years as a teacher, leaving the classroom for a whole new experience. I'm from originally from Arizona, so when I heard it was coming in, I was like, what is a Bucky's? <laughs> this year, Bucky's took the top spot as Forbes Customer Experience All-Star. Welcome to Bucky's. Scoring points for their friendly staff. Everybody's so nice. I love it. Bathrooms and their barbecue. Chop! Brisket on the board! Chop! Brisket on the board! We slow smoke it. We season it up. We inject it. And we get it out to the store. And we slice it up fresh for you right in front. Randy Polly is a director of barbecue operations who handed me my own Bucky's badge. All right. Now we're Now official. I'm official. An honorary pit master for the day. And put me to work making their signature brisket sandwich. Look oh, at all that this. barbecue. I can do this all you day. got this. <laughs> Look at that sandwich. I'm, I'm telling am you. Am I hired? You're in. Joe, I think I found my new side hustle. So now that the Sevierville store is officially open, I'm told it will never close. This is a 24-7 operation. And as you know, this is perhaps the world's largest gas station. But this is just temporary. I'm told there is another Bucky store under construction right now in Luling, Texas. That one is 75,000 square feet. They just keep getting bigger. So, and apparently I need a Bucky's bathing yeah, suit now. Here. Who knew? All right, Kathy Park, thank you so much. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.